I would now like to welcome our panelists for the session, uh, Michelle Biss, Alan Reeser McDowell, and uh, Caroline Brulette. Um, and as they join us now, Caroline, uh, Caroline will be online. Uh, so maybe as I introduce uh, each of the, the two panelists that are here in person, come on forward and grab a seat of your choice, all right? So we'll start with Michelle. Michelle Biss is the National Director of the National Right to Housing Network. As an expert in economic and social rights, she has presented at several United Nations treaty body reviews at, uh, and at Canadian parliamentary committees. Prior to her work at uh, the United Nations uh, uh, Treaty Body, uh, Michelle was the policy director and human rights lawyer at Canada Without Poverty. In 2016, she graduated from the Advanced Course on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights at Abda at uh, Academia University in Finland. She was extensive professional experience working on working for marginalized groups particularly women, persons with disabilities, newcomers, and Indigenous persons through casework, research, and community legal education. In her local Ottawa community, she sits on the board of directors of Ottawa Community Legal Services. She is a human rights lawyer and was called to the Ontario Bar in 2014. So please welcome Michelle. Alan Reeser McDowell. Alan grew up in Canada, but work, studies, and travel led him for many years to the U.S., uh, Haiti, and England, as well as to more than 60 countries through Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and Latin America. Prior to Matthew House, Ottawa, he worked as a manager for a Mennonite Central Committee in various program, fundraising, and communications roles. Alan has served in leadership and governance roles in politics and nonprofits and is currently a member of the board for the Social Housing Registry of Ottawa, Alliance uh, to End Homelessness Ottawa, and Canadian Council for Refugees. He holds a Master of Science in Development Studies from SOAS, University of London, and was a recipient of the 40 Under 40 Award in 2021. So welcome to Alan. And then online, we will be joined with uh, Caroline Bruyette, uh, who is the Executive Director of Climate Action Network Canada. Caroline is the first Francophone Director of the network and works tirelessly to create strong social consensus for climate solutions that address the convergence of crisis the world is faced with, both through national policy development and in international diplomacy forum. Caroline's commitment or commentary has appeared in L'Actualité, Canada's leading French language public affairs magazine, as well as CBC Radio Canada, The Washington Post, Reuters, Al Jazeera, and many other current affair television, radio, and written press internationally and in Canada. She joined the climate movement in 2018 when she represented Canadian youth at the G7 summit in, um, in uh, Charlevoix. Uh, Caroline holds a master's in public policy from the Lu Kuan Ye School of the National University of Singapore where she majored in economics. So, uh, Caroline, hopefully you can hear the applause for you as well. All right, so I'm going to sit here beside you as well. All right, and let's start with the questions first. Um, now they've been, uh, the panelists have each been given these questions in advance, so that's good. They're gonna be well thought through uh, uh, interventions here. So. <laughs> so the first question, and maybe we'll have each of you uh, go through and, and answer the questions. Um, and why don't we start with you, Michelle? 
and then maybe go to Caroline and then to Matthew to kind of back and forth. Does that sound good? Okay, so tell us more about your work and the advocacy priorities that you are currently advancing. At this point, uh, please mention uh, if there are any areas in which you are collaborating with CPJ, shamelessly we'll ask for that plug, <laughs> or where the advocacy priorities overlap. All right. Hi, everyone. It's so great to see so many familiar faces. Um, maybe I'll start off by just saying uh, saying this. I think um, there are those, I think, who believe that the housing crisis in Canada is caused by just a lack of supply. But when I speak to rights holders, when I speak to people experiencing homelessness, what I most often hear is that the housing crisis in Canada is being driven by a lack of justice. It really goes, I think, to CPJ's main, main theme. Um, and so in 2019, we got the very first legislation in Canada, the National Housing Strategy Act. It's our very, very first right to housing legislation. Um, has anyone here heard about the right to housing legislation? Oh, I see some familiar faces raising their hands. Nice. So in 2019, we get this right to housing legislation. It had been a called for for many decades, we'd gone to the UN, we tried to push for the right to housing or um, something adjacent to the right to housing through the courts, and we just kept meeting these roadblocks. Then in 2017, 2018, we start to see the federal government starting to get interested in the right to housing, the human right to housing. And so what happened is a group of folks came together and pushed for what eventually became the National Housing Strategy Act. When I am telling the long version of this, I tell you about all the trials and tribulations. So I just want you to picture in your head how hard we fought for this legislation. And what we got at the end of the day is a federal housing advocate. Federal housing advocate sits at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. She receives systemic claims from rights holders across the country experiencing homelessness, highlighting the kinds of things they're experiencing when they're meeting the housing and homelessness crisis in this country. So things like a lack of effective responses to encampments, things like over-speculation and financialization of housing, things like a lack of effective government policy to address women and gender diverse experiences of homelessness. And so she receives these submissions. She can do two things. She can either do an investigation on her own make recommendations. Those recommendations then go to the minister of the minister of housing, Minister Sean Fraser, um, or he, she can also refer those systemic claims to a national to the National Housing Council, who holds something called a review panel. Review panels are quite cool because they're these open hearings. They're these written hearings, these oral hearings, where people come forward and they give evidence. They give evidence about a systemic issue related to the right to housing, that review panel comes out with recommendations. And then the Minister of Housing has to respond within 120 days with a, with a uh, statement in the House of Commons in the Senate. So why am I excited about this? Here's why. For so long, we tried to access the right to housing through the courts, through other ways that we can exercise justice, ways that people who have been bearing the brunt of Canada's housing crisis, ways that they have to be heard, right? Because advocacy sometimes can only get us far enough. Going and meeting with the minister can only get us far enough. This is a way of claiming and holding justice. So recently, just uh, this past year, in fact, in February, we got the very first report from the federal housing advocate on her first review, did anyone hear about the Federal Housing Advocates report on encampments? Yeah, some people. Yes, I'm seeing some hands. Very nice. Okay. So a lot of our work had to do with helping convene folks, making sure that her recommendations were really, really strong and well-tested. We are now waiting with bated breath to hear back from the minister on whether or not he's going to accept those recommendations. Um, interestingly, I think the core of what she was saying was when we're looking at encampments across the country, the way that we need cities to be working with people in encampments is to ask them. Because so often across the country, we're hearing about police responses to encampments where people are dispersed. And then where on earth do they go? 
right? So what we're looking at with the encampment report is solutions. And one thing that was really cool is in this last federal budget, we saw a $250 million commitment to an encampment program from the federal government that's supposed to be human rights-based. So just showing you the way that we can see the flow of this human rights-based approach, this work in terms of claiming the right to housing become policy, but in a really different way. The other thing that we just did recently that uh, Citizens for Public Justice was very much involved in is there was a recent review panel open hearing on the issue of financialization of purpose-built rental housing. Financialization is all about the way that we see these major corporate actors who own between 20 to 30 percent of Canada's rental housing stock come in and treat housing as though it's a commodity treating it so that they're working in the interest of their shareholders. They're operating this as a financial firm off the side of their desk. And that results in all kinds of things like rent increases that are far above what's needed in terms of interest rate increases. We're seeing things like evictions. We're seeing things like terrible maintenance issues. And so through that process, we saw Citizens for Public Justice make a really excellent written submission to the process. And just on Wednesday, my God, was that yesterday? Time has no meaning anymore, my friends. So we saw the recommendations come out yesterday from the financialization review panel, and they're really, really solid recommendations. I'll say too, there's some work we've been doing that I know Citizens for Public Justice has been really deeply into, which is about disrupting this narrative that Canada's housing and homelessness crisis are being driven by immigration. It is a terribly xenophobic and problematic narrative that we are seeing politicians repeat again and again and again. And I know that that's something that Citizens for Public Justice staff have been doing a lot of work on. So maybe I'll, I'll wrap up my comments by saying um, the right to housing is is a really new and exciting area. We've been working at the National Right to Housing Network. Oh, Willard, I didn't say who we are. <laughs> Whoopsies. So National Right to Housing Network is a network of about 2,000 individuals and organizations who band together. We have a number of working groups as well within our network. Um, and we work collectively to use these mechanisms effectively and really hold the feet of government to the fire to make sure that the right to housing isn't just discourse. It's not just words we use. It's something real, tangible that we can hold and exercise. Um, and so it's been a total pleasure to collaborate with the awesome team at Citizens for Public Justice who have really been at the center and have been part of some of the community conversations and have been bringing, I think, what many of you have been saying in the faith community to the right to housing sector and making sure we're working in alignment. Sorry, I, I was watching the body language and uh, it took me a while to unmute. Um, Sorry, I didn't have a mic. So yes, Caroline, thank you for joining us uh, online and uh, we'll love to, to have your perspective on this first question. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, really honored to, to be here with, with all of you and looking forward to the discussion, to learning from, from fellow panelists. Let me just say that I'm, I'm sorry that I couldn't be with you all in, in person. I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow for Germany where the um, mid-year uh, climate negotiations will, will be happening uh, for the next two weeks. And so I'm joining you from, from uh, what is colonially known as, as Montreal in, in Jojage on unceded Ganyan Gehaga territory. Uh, as, as Willard introduced me, I'm Caroline Pouillet. I'm the executive director of Climate Action Network Canada, which is the country's largest coalition of groups and organizations working on climate and energy issues in the country. Our membership brings together uh, not only environmental NGOs, uh, but the country's largest national, private and public sector unions, indigenous nations, youth groups, elder groups, development groups, and we're very um, proud and grateful to count within our membership uh, many from the faith community, including citizens for public justice. 
Um, so I think uh, for, for most of us in, in Canada, we, we don't need, especially at the start of a summer where devastating wildfires have already started to occur across the country, that the climate crisis is, is happening here and now. The CBC has put together this, this really awesome and slightly terrifying, to be honest, uh, live mapping of, of climate impacts and wildfires. And the last time I, I checked, there were a hundred fires currently burning and devastating um, communities and ecosystems across the country. And, and as we know, the climate crisis uh, is deeply unjust. And so it, it affects those who are already marginalized. And so in Canada, that's uh, disproportionately in Indigenous communities. Um, and so at this moment where not only we're seeing these impacts happening, not in a distant future or in a distant geography anymore, but, but truly here and now, we're also seeing the, the data show us that we're edging really closely and dangerously to that 1.5 degree limit above, above which the world is exposing itself to the worst impacts of climate change. And that limit is so crucial, especially um, for uh, countries in the global south who are faced with, again, disproportionate impacts for, of, of this crisis, which they're least responsible uh, for, like small island developed being states who um, are, are at risk to having their countries simply disappear with, with rising tides. So um, just situating, I think, ourselves in, in the moment we are in and ref reflecting on the fact that there's there's a lot of sometimes when we reckon and grapple with that reality um, uh, difficulty to hold at the same time the fact that the only reason uh, we are we haven't been able to build the emissions the carbon emissions curve globally is is political. We can do this. We can limit warming to 1.5 degrees, no matter what um, the doomists out there say. Uh, however, to do that, we have to confront power um, and uh, those interests, uh, those corporate interests, billionaires, oil and gas executives who have been holding us back at every step of the way where governments have been trying to take climate action. So it's very interesting for me to hear uh, um from from colleagues name really the fact that these issues these converging crises right because the housing crisis intersects with the climate crisis as well um are really issues of justice that relate to our deeply unequal systems and their extractive and colonial nature um and so what do we do uh when we we we, we i think we we we're naming the problem but one of our key campaigns at canrac one we've been really excited to collaborate deeply with citizens with with just uh, with citizens for public justice especially uh mario who's who's uh here today um is our campaign on canada's fair share so the idea here is that we have this global effort ongoing to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And this effort needs to be undertaken in the principles of equity. And so Canada, as a country who is a large fossil fuel producer, an exporter, a rich country, an industrialized country, has a responsibility and capacity to act uh, faster and to do more. And so this is being reflected right now in, in two different ways. The first one is that Canada is revising its uh, climate target. So how much we're going to reduce our emissions nationally. Um, and in this moment of affordability, we have to talk about this in a way that really um, meets folks where they're at and looks at how, again, the crisis of affordability intersects with climate action. I think uh, housing here is a really interesting example when it comes to home heating costs, energy efficiency measures. Um, we know that those uh, those lower income 
folks are the ones who suffer from the most energy poverty and transport poverty. And there are ways in which we can build our communities and government programs that um, help folks wean themselves off of these fossil fuels that are not only expensive, but are volatile. So first point on reducing emissions. The, on, the other way in which this fair shares campaign is, is, um, is being implemented is that um, currently the world is ne negotiating its next climate finance goal. At the core of the Paris Agreement, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, was a grand bargain uh, between countries agreeing to limit warming to 1.5 degree and the extra ambition that was needed to do that, but the finance that would make that not only fair, but possible, right, for countries in the global south who were faced with not only disproportionate climate impacts, but also a rising debt crisis. Uh, and so in the pro in the process, those negotiations are, are 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 ongoing. That's where I'll be going in in Germany tomorrow. But Canada is also thinking about its next climate finance commitment. Uh, I had the pleasure of of being at a roundtable with ministers Gilbo and Hassan, uh, uh, Willard and Mario from CPJ uh, were there to, and we discussed our you know Climate Action Network Canada's uh, recommendations, and that is really a core part of of our work and I yeah I just really want to give a, a shout out to the CBJ team who have been an advocate not only through these advocacy moments but also in our coalition right because um we discuss these issues together and have uh to come to a common understanding and and uh uh, the CPJ team has has been a strong voice for a principled approach um, that is that is grounded in 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 justice and in equity. So I'll stop there, but really look forward to uh, the the discussion. I'll jump in. Uh, yes, hello. I'm uh, Alan from Matthew House, otherwise known as Matthew from Allen House. I don't know if anyone caught that. <laughs> I get it twice a week, so. Um, yeah, so just really quickly uh, in terms of who Matthew House is, and then it'll some of the other comments will make sense probably a little bit more. So uh, Matthew House is a local charity here uh, in the city. We have two programs, uh, Furniture Bank, uh, which I won't speak too much of this evening, but we essentially it's a food bank, but trade out food for furniture, and we furnish about, uh, I think it'll be 1,600 homes this year that we'll fully furnish, mostly for families moving out of homelessness and refugees, other newcomers to the city. Um, so I guess a plug, if you have any furniture that you don't need anymore, give us a call. Uh, refugee services is the program that most of the advocacy that we've been involved with uh, is connected to. So I'll just give you a really quick overview of that program. Um, essentially, we work specifically with refugee claimants, or some people use the term asylum seekers. And this would be, I think, uh, you were talking about your refugee sponsorship through Calvin, and there's a long history in Canada of uh, sponsored refugees. It's about 50 years, nearing 50 years, I think, since that program got started. Actually, here uh, with a uh, with a colleague, former colleague of mine uh, in Ottawa, and I'll actually refer to that a little bit later as well. But um, there's so there's a Canada does refugee sponsorship very well. There's a program that many people around the world actually come to Canada to learn about in terms of how to welcome and support refugees. But we don't have anything like that for refugee claimants. And the main difference is essentially, if you're processed overseas, you come and there's a plan and there's funding and there's community supports, whether it's churches or other community groups. Well, for refugees who arrive as asylum seekers, uh, they show up in the country and there's a, there's a system for processing the claims but there's nothing for what happens in terms of where that person goes for reaching, you know, finding shelter, food, and someone that can provide direction in terms of their settlement support. Um, so that's the area that we work in. We exist uh, because there's that gap. So our program essentially does provide all those things. It's a bed, food, and then trained, you know, expert settlement supports for someone who arrives as a refugee claimant. And the, the current situation is that many of them end up homeless uh, in the shelter system or even on the streets. Last year, I think the number was around 140,000 refugee claimants. So you can see the numbers get pretty big if, uh, you know, say half of them are homeless. Those are really significant numbers. 
Um, the good news is that there are models, uh, you know, ours being one, but there's many other organizations across the country that do this, that essentially take someone who's homeless, refugee claimant, and within a number of months, uh, they're housed, they're taking care of themselves, they're working uh, until their claim is processed. So essentially, most of the advocacy uh, that we've been doing relates to working on, and this is where it aligns with CPJ as well, there's a campaign with uh, Canadian Council for Refugees that we as members of CCR and CPJ as well are looking at essentially encouraging the government to develop a system for asylum with dignity. And this would include providing, you know, reception centers and making sure that people don't start day one homeless in the country. Um, so that's the main one. I would say maybe just a little subset because I've been doing a lot locally as well um, on this um, you can essentially look at it as a problem locally in, in our municipality. Then also you can take that writ large and it's the same issue across the country, but we have to talk to different people, right? So uh, in, in the city, we've been working with um, some, some of the political side, but mostly the bureaucrats uh, to develop a funding and supports for organizations like ours that do this work because it's very I don't want to talk about money as being the key here, but you can look at it and essentially it's a cost effective way uh, of reducing homelessness. So our program is 800 to a thousand dollars a month per bed. And within a few months, someone who is homeless is no longer homeless and they're taking care of themselves. The alternatives like a shelter bed or stay in a hotel or stay in the streets, the knock on effects in terms of healthcare costs and all sorts of other things in the sector, it gets very, very expensive very quickly. And so we've essentially the main thing locally was convincing the city to fund us and other organizations doing this work so that we could expand. So we went from, I think, probably 20 beds four or five years ago in Ottawa that were specific to refugee claimants who were homeless. And now I think we have 400 and that's a major increase. And it's, I think, going to make a huge impact over time in the city. So sort of both of those levels have been an important part. And I think... Um, yeah, maybe I'll stop there for now because obviously we have other questions as well. Well, thank you. And thanks uh, to all of you for a very thoughtful um, um, presentation. I think maybe I'm going to jump to the third question that we provided to, uh, uh, to each of you because uh, that one looks specifically at, um, at the role, exploring the role of faith communities in advocacy, because that's really the theme of our evening tonight. Um, so how would you describe the importance of involving faith communities in your areas of, of advocacy? And, and do you have a few examples of effective advocacy actions led by faith communities? Uh, so maybe we'll change the order a bit. And uh, maybe, Caroline, if we would start with you, um, and, then, and then maybe Matthew, and then Michelle. Does that sound good? Really, really appreciate that that question, and I think it's an important one, especially at this moment of, I think, our political context, which is very um, polarized. And so some of the, the things I, I had been thinking about is... Um, we, as I said, we have the the, the pleasure and, and privilege of having many members of of, of the faith based community, faith based constituency within the the CANRAC member. And and what I always appreciate in in my discussions with these groups is the the deep spiritual um, underpinning of of the action. And so, uh, Willard, I really appreciated. Uh, in your opening remarks, when you were talking about advocacy as a necessary expression of our faith. Um, and I think that's something that can be really felt uh, when, you know, working on advocacy with with um, the faith community is that that deep and profound anchoring that underpins the action, which is sometimes, you know, when you work on policy and uh, things move fast, it's easy to sometimes lose a little bit of that that anchoring especially uh in times like like these today where the crises we're facing and the devastation we're, we're seeing across the world can be really um discouraging another piece i do want to to mention mention and i think it's a really key role is um how a faith-based um communities and 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 the faith sector really um center healing as a part of of the action and i think that um 
again, in our movements, which which have to fight, right? Because we have to build our power to tackle um, those interests who um, have, um, again, at every occasion, uh, pushed back in our case against climate action through lobbying and misinformation campaign. Our fighting reflex is, is very developed, um, but sometimes we also have to come together as communities, as individuals, as, as coalitions, and um, focus on, on, on that aspect of, of, of healing and, and tending to our relationships and nurturing them. And that's something that I, 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 I find my um, colleagues and comrades from the faith-based community that are always centering. Um, the final piece I'd, I'd mention is that um, the power of, of coalitions, and, and I'm, I'm sure Michelle can speak to that as well, is that um, uh, the more diverse we are, the more powerful we are. The really the, the point is having a, a cross section of, of folks and of constituencies that represent the diversity of, of the peoples of, of Canada. And I think especially at a moment, as I was saying earlier, um, like this, where um some politicians and some industries are instrumentalizing climate action for political gain. Um, having a diversity of, of constituencies able to say, well, you know, actually we, we care about this and talk to um, parties and politicians from across the aisle on, on, on this sector um, really helps build the case for climate action to be a cross-partisan concern. Because as, as long as um, some parties keep not taking it seriously will be held back in in Canada when it when it comes to that. And so, um, of course, you ex you expect a climate activist um, to uh, talk about climate change, uh, but when there are voices um, uh, like uh, like coming from the faith based commu communities who uh, speak about it. Um, to uh, political parties that be may be more receptive to those voices and, and arguments, it has a, an immense amount of of power. Thing. And just so that people aren't confused, right? It's Alan from Matthew House, <laughs> not Matthew from Allen House. Uh, sorry about that. No, no, I don't actually care. I literally, it literally happens twice a week, and the my favorite was. Uh, I think it was a week or two ago when someone emailed me and they called me Matt. So I was getting a short form of Matt. <laughs> that was new. I thought that was amazing. Um, and I used to actually, Willard knows my father. They worked together in a number of ways over the years. And uh, before I came to Matthew House, I used to always get called Andrew, which is my father's name. So I've, I've switched names. Um, we'll see what's next. My next generation will, next uh, decade, will get another name. Um, yeah, so the uh, in terms of actually, I referred to this briefly, but in terms of the importance of faith communities, I'll just I'll just maybe highlight again. I think that in Canada, uh, you know, the significant um, sort of piece of advocacy that made a real change over the last five decades was that private sponsorship model that was developed, and that was with uh, Mennonite Central Committee uh, here in Ottawa. There was an office, an advocacy office, and they worked with the feds uh, back in the '70s to create that model. So a great example that the, the rest of the world, I think, in, like I said, is also looked to. Um, so I think, you know, 50 odd years later, I guess, in terms of where I'm hoping faith communities can get engaged uh, in, in this space is in creating something similar. It's not going to look the same. So when I say similar, I don't mean copying and pasting the program, but the idea of having some coordination in a program and a plan for what happens when refugee claimants uh, first come to Canada. Uh, and like I said, we have an excellent, there's always room for improvement, but I would say a good uh, processing side, but there's nothing for the supports and the shelter and the food that people need when they first arrive. And so the combination there is going to be really important. Uh, I mentioned Canadian Council for Refugees has launched a campaign, uh, which I was uh, involved with. CPJ is uh, going to be supporting that. And I'd really love to see churches like this one dig into that issue. And I think, you know, I would say 
the best advocacy that I can see is when people are actually involved in the issue. So I would say if it's something that is interesting to you, you know, find organizations in the community, wherever you're from. There's lots of us. I think there's something like 35 organizations around the country that work specifically in providing that shelter and supports uh, to refugee claimants when they first arrive. So there's a lot of us uh, get engaged and then hopefully also get in, involved with the uh, the advocacy side to hopefully create uh, asylum with dignity in this country. On to me. Okay. Uh, so when the, I was thinking about this question, I was thinking a little bit of like to place myself growing up, um, I I grew up very much in the Catholic Church. Uh, my mom in Mississauga, my mom is a Catholic or is now a retired Catholic school teacher. I'm pretty sure that they're on Zoom right now watching me, so I'm slightly terrified saying that. But um, I grew up very much in the Catholic community, and and I think what always struck me was just the deep sense of community that we had. You know, going to church in um, community events, like the the depth of relationships. And I think very, very much to, to other points that were made of the shared understanding that you're coming together with a sense of love. And I'm struck by that quote that I'm completely misremembering. So who knows what I'll say, but it's something like justice is a public display of love, or it's like the public act, Natalie, it's something like that. Sure, something like that. But, but justice being this public display of love. And I think that's what advocacy is as well, as it's standing up as a community, collaborating together and finding where those points are that we can make our communities better places. Um, so with that in mind, what I'll say is there's a couple of really, I think, interesting moments that I think that the different faith communities will have to engage in the right to housing coming up. Um, one that I'll flag is I was mentioning these review panels, these open hearings on the right to housing. Um, the very next review panel, it it's, you know, I can talk about it. The next review panel that's going to happen is on the issue of women and gender diverse experiences of homelessness, in particular, Indigenous women and two spirit persons. So, this issue of women's homelessness is one that I think um, we haven't talked about very much in terms of public policy. A lot of Canada's housing programs or homelessness programs are kind of just like generic homelessness pro programs. We are supposed to be spending 25% in terms of our housing and homelessness programs on gender-based targets. No one's measuring that. In fact, like the, the data to measure that is coming really from civil society, if anything. There are some efforts within CMHC, I'll nod to, but it just kind of goes to show that so much more needs to be done in terms of women and gender diverse homelessness. I'm also conscious of the fact that I think a lot of folks in faith communities uh, and a lot of folks in churches touch women's homelessness and gender diverse homelessness quite a bit, whether it be members of their congregation, whether it be members of their community or, or people who are coming through the community work, whether it be, whether it be just people within their community. Um, so I think there's going to be a real opportunity. So when that review panel launches, there's going to be another opportunity for folks to make written submissions to the review panel, to ask to appear in the oral hearings for that review panel, and getting to the depth of what is the real experience of rights holders, of people experiencing homelessness, hearing directly from folks, folks who are supporting those folks as well, is really going to get those juicy recommendations that can be moved forward. And then I think it's also going to be up to many faith communities as well to hold the minister to account to implement those recommendations, to make sure that we're transforming our housing programs into things that are into programs that are genuinely addressing core housing need and homelessness. Um, I will shamelessly plug that if, if folks in your communities are interested in engaging in the right to housing mechanisms, we have a newsletter. It can be found at our URL, which is housingrights.ca. Uh, we pu regularly publish that newsletter with news all across the housing 
housing justice sector, but in particular related to the, the right to housing mechanism. So if ever you're interested in a really cool new way of exercising justice, just uh, hit us up. We've got a very cool newsletter and a lot of great working groups to get folks engaged in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Say that again loudly. Justice is love in public. And I remembered it and didn't have to ask Natalie for those who were on Zoom. Okay. Yes, by Cornell West. All right. We want to have time for question and answers also, but maybe let's do one final question and we'll look for kind of uh, pity answers. How's that? <laughs> but uh, maybe to frame it that um, many, many people's uh, charitable impulse is easily ignited by service providers, right? And, and we applaud that because that's, that's needed. But, um, but we're looking at, at uh, the realm of, of advocacy. So why, why would you say is advocacy so important in that mix as well? So not to replace us, uh, you know, being charitably in, engaged and supporting frontline uh, service providers, but why why is advocacy important? And maybe this time we'll start with Alan, and then go to um, Michelle, and then uh, Caroline at the end. Yeah, I guess uh, the short answer for me would be because of the potential impact. So if we just take the local versus national sort of example I was talking about before. You know, although hard, if I work super hard locally and we have enough beds for refugee claimants in Ottawa in X number of years, and we sort of like solved that challenge here in Ottawa, amazing, but all the better if we can do that nationally as well. And so essentially we, I'm always sort of working at those two levels with, I mean, obviously with partners when you start to get it to national, but, uh, you know, essentially I have those two goals at the same time, like do what we can with the service provision side here and that means like it's a lot of logistics like we're renting houses we're hiring staff and we're providing support to i think it's like you know 190 beds right now and so that's a lot of like service provision and then at the same time in the back of my mind on the side of my desk constantly thinking about how do we actually apply the learnings and the principles and look at this at a national level so that we can have a system that actually works across the country and then have that impact be you know 10 100 thousand fold what we can do in our own community. So that's the way I would think about it. I think you just need both. You just need both. You need the frontline services and you need the advocacy because if you, you know, you, you can work and work and work, but if you're not addressing the upstream solutions, the stream is just going to keep wiping you away. Um, we find that in the homelessness sector. Holy, do we find that in the homelessness sector? We didn't anticipate COVID to happen. We didn't anticipate um, the rise in, in interest, the over, well, I think we did anticipate the rise in over financialization, but, you know, we're seeing the systemic cost causes of the housing crisis just totally blast us. And so as much as we work on the frontline solutions, if we don't do advocacy, this homelessness crisis, the housing crisis is just going to keep hitting us. I think we have an assumption in Canada too, that government is just going to figure it out or that government provides civil society organizations with funding, but they just don't. <laughs> That's the reality. A lot of, in fact, Civil society participation comes from donors. It comes from foundations. You know, a lot of fundraising work. A lot of my work is fundraising work. I'm sure, Willard, a lot of your work is fundraising work. And so the reality is, is that you need, you just need the support for the advocacy. Otherwise, you're just not going to get those big solutions. And, you know, I, I talk about financialization over speculation of housing a lot. And I look at the folks who are pushing the other side of the narrative, the really problematic side of the narrative, they are so well-funded and well-resourced lobbyists. And so without some like real strength and power and, you know, capacity, there's just a real challenge in terms of fighting back, especially with the rise of populism and the really problematic stuff that's coming politically. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, your thoughts. 
Yeah, uh, unsurprisingly, I am going to align with uh, with my fellow panelists. And I think the first part of, of my answer is power, is why we need advocacy. I, at the end of the day, the issues that we're faced with are um, the result of some a minority of people, of really powerful and rich people, um, who are blocking the policies that not only would make the, the planet sustainable, but would make uh, the majority of people's lives better, um, safer, and the world more just. And so historically, we know that how um, people have have won fights uh, over these interact issues that seemed intractable with really powerful interests behind them is um, uniting together as, as movements to create that uh, people power. Uh, and that's really the 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 way that advocacy needs to uh, confront, I think, the problems that we're faced with. And, and that very much applies to the climate crisis, right? We can't solve that without government intervention to transform our economy and, and bring it to zero emissions. And that requires confronting um, the fossil fuel industry, which has had a grip on our policy at the federal and, and provincial level. Uh, level across this country. This said, I, I really want to say that the two pieces go together and that there's a lot of power actually in bringing them together. Um, I often say when I speak to governments that within Climate Action Network Canada, we have people who are pushing and fighting for climate policy, but we also have the folks who very concretely day to day are implementing climate action in their communities, in their regions, in their workplaces, in their churches. And that make that makes our, our message a lot more grounded and, uh, and uh, powerful in the end. All right. Excellent. Thank you. What an excellent panel. And I'm sure that there are many uh, people that are eager to ask some questions. So let's transition to question and answer. And I think there'll be, will there be somebody running with a uh, mic or will you take the mic for me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So who has uh, the first question uh, here? in this conversation. All right. And online as well, uh, we'll be ready to monitor, uh, to receive questions online too. Feel free to put them into the chat and then we can bring them forward. Thank you very much. That was a very uh, enjoyable panel. Yep. Good. Um, Michelle, I, I wish this um, had been about a week and a half ago where I could have gotten more ammunition from you for a dialogue I'm engaged in with a member of parliament. And um, it's the question where the response is, well, um, there's lots of issues around housing, but you can't say that immigration isn't one of the real problems because we've had added a million and a half people in X number of years. And when you get a million and a half more people, that puts pressure on the housing stock. So don't you think it's time to cut back on immigration is the reply. You made reference to not getting caught up in that. Um, I've noticed in networks that I link with, people who five years ago never raised sounds the issue are, are now, now moving to be sounds. really hesitant um, around this issue of immigration. Could you give me some more ammunition, please? I sure can. Ooh, I sure can. You know, I, 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 it's just, it's... It's such a false, it, it's taking a data point and putting such a wild narrative onto the data point. I mean, there's there is a lack of affordable housing in this country. Let's acknowledge that. Um, something like 300,000 units of affordable housing between 2011 and 2016, I believe, just in the province of British Columbia, were lost to financialization of housing. If we want to look at the issues, what is causing a lack of affordable housing? It's this over-speculation issue. It's this issue 
of large real estate investment companies or um, or major financialized actors coming in, taking up affordable housing, turning it into luxury apartments. We are living in the city of Ottawa, for goodness sake. We have Heron Gate. We know what happened in Heron Gate. And how can we look at that and say, oh, the issue is immigration? Like, come on. Like, we've got these act, these major financialized actors who are, who are just coming in and devastating our housing supply. And then let's look as well at the housing programs that have been created by the federal government. Well, there have been some good ones. The Rapid Housing Initiative, for example, is a, a, solid, exa- a solid example of a program that was actually for creation of affordable housing. But there's a lot of evidence out there to show that the other programs developed through the National Housing Strategy weren't actually created for the purpose of affordable housing. In fact, I've been told by officials at CMHC when when I say, well, you know, evidence is showing these aren't addressing core housing need or homelessness. They say, oh, well, that's never what they were supposed to be for. And that's where the disconnect exists right? We're not creating housing programs that are affordable. And I think notice this as well in discussion from from, um, officials on housing. Watch for it. They'll say, we need more housing stock. But do they say we need more affordable housing stock? It's that affordable piece that keeps getting missing from the equation. And then we see major financialized actors or just financialized actors coming in and taking advantage of that and turning it around for a profit. The issue for the housing crisis is equality. There's so much evidence. The other piece I'll say as well, and then I promise I will stop my rant on this, but you know, Canada is not the only country experiencing a housing crisis. We are experiencing a major housing crisis, but we can look to other countries all around the world. We can look to the way that financialization devastated Ireland's housing situation. We can look and see that this this inequality that is at the core is just really exacerbating it. So I just, I think it's happened for, you know, as as one of my colleagues has, has written before, immigration has always been blamed for housing crises or housing gaps, always for decades, back to, I think, the Second World War. This is a narrative that we use when we are too lazy to look at the equality issues. I'm grumpy about this. Uh, but just just really underscoring, this is a xenophobic stance and that is manipulating people's attention away from what the real issues are, which is inequality and a lack of proper investment in affordable housing. Alan, do you want any comments? Yeah. Um, yeah, I won't, I'll, I'll keep it short. I mean, I think I have a, a few thoughts on this. Some of them are yeah, I'll say them. <laughs> I, I'm. I, I guess I don't have an issue with the question around immigration numbers because obviously, if you look at it, if we had 20 million people show up, it would be too many for our system. And I think so. From my perspective, I don't mind that question. I think the concern is, oftentimes, it's xenophobia masked in a question, and they don't. It's not really that they're asking that question seriously. I think it's so. That would be my concern with that question. Is it's it's the people who are not seriously engaging in that discussion and it's more xenophobia. Um, so I, but I think we do have to have those discussions to be honest, because realistically it does, we were a country of what, 40 million. Um, so what is a number that we can manage in terms of people coming into the country, integrating well, uh, being healthy, housed, employed, contributing members of the community, all those things, because ultimately uh, our country needs immigration. Our, our birth rate is about 1.5 right now. So we're shrinking if we don't have immigration. Maybe that's fine. Likely not. So how do we manage immigration? Well, I think that's a fine question. Um, from my perspective, when it comes to the asylum seeker side, because there's a lot of discussions around that, uh, when people associate newcomers and homelessness, and then they blame homelessness crisis on newcomers as well, I would look at that question more in line with from my perspective, regardless of what you think about immigration, there is a certain number of people that are here and what are we going to do in terms of providing support for them? 
regardless of whether you think it's a good idea, if you have 140,000 claimants in the country, the best case scenario is a refugee claimant is housed, supporting themselves, working, healthy, all the things that you would want just for yourself. Because the alternative is terrible for that individual, for the community, for everyone. And so I think we can almost, from my perspective, I would say separate out your feelings of immigration and actually look at what is best for our community and our country and individuals. And I think it means parsing out some of those things. And it's very challenging because people have very strong opinions and sometimes you don't even know what you're talking about. And I don't mean that to you, but it's just things are kind of layered in and you're, you know, if this person's xenophobic, well, it doesn't matter what they think about immigration numbers. It's, that's a whole different conversation to have then, right? Question from Annie. It is great to see faith-based organizations are engaged, but how to engage individuals in the pews? Elected officials are interested to hear from individuals who are potential voters. Who would like to start that? Uh, Caroline, did you hear the question? You wanna, do you wanna try and uh, take the first stab at that? Yeah, and I, I really like that question because, again, I think if we, if we want to win at, at tackling those converging crises that, that we're facing, we need to reconceptualize the role of, of individuals. Uh, when it comes to fighting the climate crisis, often we hear our roles as, uh, as consumers. Um, and let me digress and go into a little bit of a, of a rant too and, and a tangent here, which is that actually it's it's BP, British Petroleum, who put forward that, that campaign about uh, individual carbon footprint, uh, which, you know, really makes us think about our individual actions and, and how that impacts um, climate which is important. Our individual actions are not, they're not irrelevant, but they obscure that power dynamic that, that we've been talking about um, earlier. And the fact that, for instance, in, in Canada, um, the largest share of our emissions, close to 30%, come from the oil and gas sector. And these emissions have been growing while other sectors, other consumers, other workers are picking up the, the slack. And so changing that shift from individual consumer to citizen is, is really key. And I think as uh, faith-based organizations, you do connect directly with people. Um, in in churches in in the pews as 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 Annie asked in in um in in her question and so encouraging people basically there's an there's an art to doing that it's organizing I'm sure there are fo folks here who are who are well, doing that on on a day to day and and perhaps better at it than than me but I think talking to people uh, and firing them up as as citizens to um to going to talk actually to their uh, elected officials uh, is, is one of the most powerful things we can do, especially at a moment right now where there's a big pre-electoral moment um, going on and when climate action is being instrumentalized by some parties as a, uh, something that... Um, can be used for for political gain, and so I think it's really important um, for you not only to talk to your elected MP, but also talk to uh, local candidates that we're seeing started to be nominated across the aisle. Again, this is not a partisan issue. Um, the safety of 
our planet. Uh, it's an issue that, that, you know, makes the economy better. It makes health better. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, there's maybe a reflection and obviously, again, I'll do my, uh, my self-interested bit here. Climate Action Network Canada would be really interested in, in talking with CPJ and other faith-based organizations and churches in, uh, how we can work together to think about, uh, uh, engaging people in, in that way. Maybe what I'll what I'll say quickly just to to add on to that is very brief, briefly is one of the most effective things for advocacy can be members of parliament hearing from their own constituents that can be really persuasive. Um, and so one thing that I, I might encourage folks to do is to check out some of the campaigns that are out there. I know Citizens for Public Justice has some really cool campaigns throughout the year, for example. And I feel like they all you guys also do at like communications materials to talk. Yes. Okay. Okay. Our friends are nodding, nodding. Yes. It might be really useful for, for many folks to take a look at some of those and consider meeting with your member of parliament. If you, if you haven't already, because I think there's a real beauty, a lot in what citizens for public justice does and, and others here do in terms of taking uh, advocacy calls to action and bringing people together and having folks in your constituencies across the country meet with your member of parliament, taking the, that common message can be really powerful because those MPs then meet with each other in Ottawa or if your MP is a cabinet minister who then goes into a cabinet meeting saying, oh, I've heard this from my constituency too, can be really, really powerful in terms of moving the needle. All right, thank you. Any other questions up front here? Oh, my name is John Williams. I belong to the Social Justice Committee of a parish, Catholic parish here in Ottawa. We have 16 members, which is pretty good for that sort of committee. Uh, however, uh, half of us, not half, uh, six of us are in our 80s. Uh, and most of the others are in their mid to late 70s. So uh, we're winding down, basically. And, and there's no cohort of uh, 40s, 30s to 60s, say, uh, anywhere near to that are coming up to replace us. And I'm sure there's lots of reasons for this. It's a mainline church that's been losing members over the years uh, rapidly. Um, and it's not just because people are dying off, but because uh, younger people, middle-aged people, just are, are not interested for a whole lot of reasons. Um, uh, now, the panelists today are all in this generation that we are hoping will come and uh, take our place. Um, and obviously, you three panelists are very much engaged uh, but I wonder if you can give us any advice as to how to um, in, encourage, uh, energize uh, your age cohorts to join you in this important work. Who would like to start with that? That's an excellent question. I, I might have some thoughts. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. I, I, I don't, I don't have a necessary direct answer to this question, but one thought that comes to mind because within the climate movement, we have a very active youth who uh, in many ways have been at the forefront, at the front line and, and leading this as a matter of, of intergenerational equity. I think when, when asked questions about, uh, about engaging folks across generations, the things that 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 I hear them say a lot is that they want older generations to really be uh, taking up some of of that work. So I think my my response would just be to share appreciation for for what you're doing, what you and your church and and your committee are 
are doing. Um, and I'm actually so inspired by um, this movement of, of seniors and parents and grandparents who uh, are really heeding that call from the youth. At uh, Climate Action Network Canada, we have within our membership SCAN, so the, the Seniors Climate Action Network. We have uh, groups of, of grandmothers, GASP, um, we, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember all the acronyms now, but we have these really amazing movement elders who are there with us in the fight. And I think that intergenerational kind of dialogue and perhaps creating that space is a way to um, engage uh, and and learn and and kind of bring value across generations again in that spirit of building coalitions that bring together really diverse voices and that comes to age as well. Thank you. So I think we'll uh, we'll close it up here this evening. I want to thank everybody for your participation, for your presence, and. So we started out at the uh, AGM for CPJ, and I was able to wow you with uh, with the uh, incredible skill of our staff. But now I'm sure you are equally wowed with the incredible um, depth of our partnerships here that you've seen in these in the panel. So I know you are eager to show a round of uh, appreciation for uh, Alan, Michelle, and uh, Caroline. So thank you so much. So for those in person, we have snacks available yet uh, in the uh, entryway there. So please help yourself to some more. And again, thank you for all those uh, online and your participation. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Caroline, thank you very much for joining us online. Appreciate that. And thank you all for coming out on this lovely, beautiful evening. So uh, please stay and, and enjoy some more. Thank you.